right, we are going to head to Matthew chapter number one, uh, verse uh, number 18 through 23, uh, as we continue through this sermon series on hope uh, in the season of Advent, uh, in this whole season that we are engaging with. Uh, I want you to appreciate that we have a blessed hope that is not extinguished, it is not uh, evacuated, it is not absent. We have a hope that, as we've said in weeks past, is on the lookout for us. We have a hope that is seeking us out. We have a hope that is making some ways straight for us. A hope that uh, is indeed um, working even beyond our capacity to see, sense, or feel. But this hope is uh, a very present help in the time of trouble, this hope. Uh, has moments where it does show up in ways that are undeniable. And this hope, when it shows up in our lives, should give you and I some confidence. So in the moments where hope seems to be absent, we can look back and say, I remember when hope showed up for me. Well, we are uh, on this fourth Sunday of Advent um, dealing with all the many ways in which hope shows up as a prelude to the arrival of the concretized uh, uh, birth of Jesus. That how many of you know, as Jesus breaks into our life, uh, there are moments that you and I can point to in the rearview mirror and say, wow, I had no idea that that was Jesus all along. Anybody have that kind of testimony? That, you know, when the, the, the concrete expression of Jesus' arrival happens in our life, it all feels like it's added up to reach the, 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 the conclusion that, wow, this is indeed Jesus. But going through the process of Jesus' arrival can sometimes cause you and I to feel like Man, we are just either experiencing a series of random challenges <laughs> or did I do something to deserve these, uh, these, these, these uh, mishaps that, that are going on? This is, uh, you know, part of the experience we have as followers of Jesus to continue to um, um, find God when it appears God is absent. Um, and one of the great things that the book of Matthew, particularly in its account of the arrival of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, um, the book of Matthew is attempting to uh, deliver the, the account of Jesus' arrival to an audience, a Jewish audience, who were on the lookout for Jesus, but not always aware how Jesus would show up. The book of Matthew, if you take a look at the verses that precede uh, the, 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 the actual uh, meat of our text today, uh, has a long genealogy, a long record of Jesus' lineage, if you will. Uh, it talks about uh, 14 generations and 14 generations and 14 generations. It breaks down the kind of history uh, that predates Jesus' arrival, that Jesus just did not arrive in a vacuum. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't mean to be too carnal on, on this Sunday, but, you know, as, as I and I'm sure all of us here in the Yay area were watching that verses last night, I think we all appreciated, amen, the, the nice history lesson and, and, and the geography lessons and, and the, the kind of hyphy and go dumb uh, historical uh, reflections that, that, that both Short and uh, 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 E-40 were giving, not just to us, but to everybody, right? That, that I think, you know, one of the great uh, takeaways of last night, for me at least, is that the, the sound of the Yay area, at least on the hip-hop side, it emerges out of a story and a soil of concrete people. I mean, you know, for all you folk who who, who not too hip about that, uh, I'll take you over to the to the to the gospel side. You know, the Hawkins family, right? The, they 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 helped us to to be identified in the Bay Area with a sound that has literally 
transform the world. And this sound is grounded in the lives of ordinary people. Well, I want you to know, uh, loved one, that the arrival of Jesus is also grounded in ordinary people. That this arrival of Jesus is not something that is reserved for the elite or the special or the uber qualified. But Jesus' arrival is ongoing in the lives of God's people, regardless of your circumstance, situation, or social location. And it is in this way that Matthew is seeking to break down to a people looking for a Messiah, helping them to realize, listen, you don't have to look any further because as verse number 18 says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And it says that Jesus' mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, and she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, and all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Verse 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The word of God for us, the people of God. Come on, let us say thanks be to God together. Amen. God bless you. Well, uh, for this, uh, this uh, sermon title today, uh, you know, as we've been preaching through the season of hope, I'm just, I'm captivated by Uh, verse number 23, which comes out of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that the virgin, the young woman, the young girl will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Simply, our title today is Emmanuel is our hope. Emmanuel is our hope. Come on, pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you, to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me, the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the Lord say amen. Amen. Emmanuel is our hope. Now, uh, as we have powerfully uh, articulated for the last month or so, hope is a theological virtue that is birthed within the soul and the spirit of the believer as a extension of that which God divinely literally downloads in us. That hope is not a political term. Hope is not a sentimental term. Hope is not uh, a, 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 a false sense of possibility, but hope is an active virtue, an active theological Uh, uh, attribute that is indeed at work in the life of everyone who is actively following the ways of Jesus. Uh, The Apostle Paul talks about the uh, three things that remain after all of these, charity, uh, hope, and and, 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 uh, love, love, hope, and And oh my goodness, I'm forgetting the the last one. Amen. Uh, These three things remain: love, hope, and 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 faith. My God, today. (laughs) Thank you, thank you, Minister Wayne. Amen. Shout, shouting a brother out, Pastor Tanisha. One of y'all. Amen. Thank God for the three in the room helping me preach this morning. Right? Love, faith, and hope. All three of these things are indeed virtues, uh, gifts, divine. Uh, gifts that are literally seeded in our hearts, the soil of your heart, the soil of your life, the soil of your experience, have these seeds always at work. And when there are moments in our lives where it appears 
like our lives are spiraling out of control. Our lives are being consumed by the external circumstances. Our lives are feeling contradictory to that which we have believed and trusted as a promise from God. It is the presence of these three that persist and remain in our lives. Well, as we come into this moment in time of Christmas, as we push our way through this fourth season of Advent, it is not lost upon me, and certainly I believe on many of you, that we are still in the valley of the coronavirus. We are still trudging through the, the reality of a political uh, uh, a framework and, and system that has apparently lost its ability to, to at least maintain its own commitments to justice and sensibility. We are in a moment and a time where our families are under emotional attack, spiritual attack. Uh, grief has, has gripped the families uh, of our congregation. Many of, 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 of us this year have lost loved ones. We have experienced the, the sickness and illness. Some even right now are, are, jer are traveling through the valley of the shadow of death. And there are moments when uh, it comes around to Christmas where these are some of the most difficult times to be reminded of the arrival of Jesus. That Jesus' arrival is not just limited to a December 25th holiday, holy day, day set apart by the church so we don't get amnesia, but the arrival of Jesus is perpetual. It is ongoing. But what do you do when the arrival of Jesus does not offset trouble? What do you do when the arrival of Jesus does not defeat the enemy right as, as, as right on your time schedule. What do you do when the arrival of Jesus does not displace the depression or the heartbreak or the, the, the tragedies that are, are present in our lives? I mean, it is then, for me, the power of this passage that we've read today and the material of this passage that I think gives you and I some significant insight for when it says that this child will be known as Emmanuel. Jesus will be known as Emmanuel, which means God is with us. I want you, child of God, to rehearse that in your mind, that the greatest hope we have is that God is with us. That God being with you and I is indeed our greatest hope. Not, again, a hope that is about the esoteric and the ambiguous declaration of possibilities. But it is the active presence of God with us that catalyzes our hope, that inflames it, that makes it alive and dynamic. I want you to know that uh, God being with you is a wonderful catalyst for hope. The idea that you and I can be cognizant that no matter what I go through, God is with me. I don't want you to take this for granted because there are many people who are attempting to argue the opposite. There are those who are using the falsehoods of their political arguments to try and argue that not God is with you, but that God is against you. There are those who want to use their narrow theological um, uh, uh, reflections uh, and, and not argue that God is with you during the season, but they want you to believe that God is against you. You may even have been socialized in your own mind. And the socialization of your religious orientation, your cultural orientation, your racial orientation, your sexual orientation, your economic 
orientation. You're situated in the world. You could indeed have an experience where you are having a conversation in your mind that is trying to convince you that God is not with you. But I want you to know that one of the great gifts of Christmas is that God's arrival is not uh, based on the calendar or the approval of human beings. That God's arrival is set in heaven. It is set in the will and the plans of God. And if God's arrival is not predicated on the human beings or the circumstances or the, the temporal realities of our existence, then how many of you know neither is your deliverance? Neither is your sustaining, neither is literally your ability to continue to find God's presence within your reach. In this particular passage, we see that Matthew is attempting to convince a people who are literally in a, a, another season of not just exile, uh, but a season of occupation. They are, although in the land of Jerusalem, they are not able to move freely throughout their own country. They are a people that are constantly reminded of the, 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 the presence of a emperor, of a political system, of a human hierarchy that seeks to diminish their own imago dei as their own tradition has taught them through the course of their sojourn on the earth. I want you to know that there are moments, there are seasons, there are realities in our lives where we can often find ourselves um, in a, as the writer says, a strange land, a land where it does not always match up, a time and a season where you, you, you feel like you've done all you can, but all you can have still created some dissonance. And that is the, the story of what we see here in the text. Joseph is a, a man who is trying to do the right thing. The scripture describes Joseph as someone who is faithful to the law, someone who has indeed uh, found him a, a, a wife, someone to build a life with, and yet she comes up pregnant before they even get a chance to consummate their marriage. I want you to know that for us who are, are used to hearing this story for our whole life, this does not sound as scandalous as it ought to. Amen. Amen. I, 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 you know, and I, I know for some of us, uh, you know, we, 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 we find the Virgin Mary story to be uh, one of the most bedrock, foundational, inspirational, miraculous stories of the Christian faith, and it ought to be. But I want you to dip yourself into the humanity of this experience. That Joseph, someone who was attempting to be a faithful adherent to the law, both social, legal, political, moral, found himself in quite a conundrum. And this conundrum forced him to have to answer a certain kind of question. What is my response to this extremely conflicting and complex situation. Well, I want you to know that it's so powerful for us to keep understanding that the arrival of God in our lives is not um, just uh, engineered for the simple moments, but there are complex moments, socially complex moments, uh, personally complex moments, uh, vocationally complex moments, relationally complex moments that the arrival of Jesus is literally at home with. That Jesus knows how to show up in our complexities without feeling intimidated by its circumstance. You ought to just put that in a chat to remind you that Jesus shows up in my complexity. That the gift of this season is that even in the complex moments of my life, Jesus is not intimidated to show up. And listen, the preparation that is often needed for you and I to experience the uh, arrival of Jesus will often uh, invoke other actors and other uh, mechanisms to help us. 
Joseph had to get a visit from an angel in a dream in order for him to be prepared. Joseph had to uh, navigate the kinds of legal and, and social concerns in his mind in order for him to be at, at peace. And then Joseph had to make a decision that I am not going to allow these external circumstances to cause me to miss out on a divine arrival of the uncreated one in my life. God shows up in our complexities. God does not reserve his arrival for the easy moments in our lives. But during the season of COVID, I want you to know God shows up. During your grief and your concerns, God shows up. During the, 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 the political and social moments of upheaval, God shows up. And what does God do when God shows up? God does what God wills, but the operative moment or the operative truth for you is that God is with you. And listen, God is for you. And this is one of the most challenging moments, I think, of the follower of Jesus who is used to power being over-associated with our own a conception of God, that sometimes we think God's power is fully expressed through domination, when in reality, God's power is fully expressed through God's persistence. That God is persistently showing up. God is persistently with you and I. God is persistently present. Even when you don't know God to be there, how do many of you know that God is there? Even when you can't see God, God is present. And the presence of God, it creates a hopeful possibility that things will work out in our favor. Do I have any witnesses in here today that can just bear witness that God keeps showing up persistently. God cuts through all of the noise. God cuts through all of the doubt. God cuts through all of the circumstances. And God shows up. God shows up even before I'm aware God is there. And all of a sudden, I look up and I find God. It's, it's, it's kind of like God being in my presence. And I not know that God is there until I See him on another level. I was reading a, a, a article this week about uh, how uh, some 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 astrophysicists have literally found another dimension of, of 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 protons, I believe, and that these protons exist in our in our reality. I'm sorry, in our presence, but on a different dimension. And that they only manifest themselves when certain conditions are met. That it has to be a certain temperature and it has to be a certain configuration of light. And out of these certain conditions, these protons that are present all the time actually become uh, present to us. Can you imagine what it means, child of God, that God is present but the conditions have not yet been made for you to be able to fully grasp God's presence. That this is what hope is. Hope is that thing which is present even when the conditions do not bear themselves for you to see it. Hope is present behind the scenes, under the ground, over your head, beside you, working things out in our favor. You ought to just put it in the chat. My God is with us. God is with us. Hope is found in these unlikely places. But let me also say to you that hope also inhabits those spaces that are considered uninhabitable. Now, it's important for you and I to uh, not gloss over the use of Mary in this story. In, in, in Luke chapter 1, uh, it speaks about the Magnificat, the, 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 the testimony of Mary, who, who proclaims the arrival 
of God, the, 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 the high places being made low. Again, Mary attempting to capture that this is how God decided to show up. God could have showed up in the house of Herod. God could have shown up in a noble's house. God could have showed up in the policeman's house. But no, God said, I want to show up, listen, in the body of this vulnerable, pregnant teenage girl. Uh, Carrie Day, one of the homies who uh, is one of our most foremost uh, womanist theologians, she says it like this, that Jesus was not, conceived, was not just conceived in a woman, he was conceived in the womb of a Palestinian Jewish peasant under a rogue state. Lord, have mercy. I know some of y'all are super patriotic and you would never describe your country as a rogue state, but I want you to know we are living right now in a rogue state. Uh, and I hope some of us are praying and planning, amen, uh, for some circumstances that may get out of control. But she goes on to say, God shows up in history in this way. How timely for the current political economic context we find ourselves in. Listen, God chose to come in the most vulnerable, marginalized body. In the most powerful empire of its day. Do you see the way in which God has this juxtaposition? This, 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 this radical kind of comparison, these, these polar opposites, right? That God says, I will show up in this world, but I will not show up in the most powerful empire as a powerful figure, but I will show up in the most vulnerable, marginalized body. It teaches us that within the most vulnerable circumstances, God shows up to bring life and with it possibilities. That it is in these most vulnerable circumstances, your depression, that you ought to be able to, with confidence, tell yourself that even though I am depressed through here, God is with me. Shows up for you who are finding yourselves uh, diagnosed with COVID positive tests, that even in my COVID diagnosis, God is with me. Showing up in those places where even some of us have lost loved ones. I want you to know that God is not absent in the loss of your life, but God is present with you. That as a matter of fact, this is where God seems to be most comfortable. God seems to be most comfortable in our most hurting and vulnerable situations. That God wants you and I to know that God arrives on God's own terms, but God always brings new possibilities and life after this. I want you to just tell yourself that there is life after this. There is life. There is, there is love. There is joy. There is peace after this. And when God shows up, God arrives in the most unexpected ways and in the most unexpected packages. Uh, one of our, our, our friends, our, our, our homies, uh, 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 Christina Cleveland, has been uh, writing and working on these powerful, powerful uh, expressions of what they call Black Madonnas. These expressions of the mother of Jesus as a dark-skinned woman throughout history have often been suppressed in the imagination of the global church, right? But it's important to say that if Jesus was a dark-skinned Palestinian, I'm sorry, if yeah, Jesus was a dark-skinned Palestinian Jew, then the mother of Jesus had to be a dark-skinned Palestinian woman, amen? And so what does it mean then that you and I can grab a hold uh, not to the pigmentation of, of, the, of, of the Messiah or the package, the mother, the woman the Messiah was born through, but the social location. That just like I said last week or the week before when I preached, that, that when the book of Isaiah is proclaiming the good news, these prophecies, that there are everyday ordinary oracles Everyday people who find themselves proclaiming the good news. Well, child of God, I want you to know that the gift of Mary, an uh, uh, ordinary, dark-skinned, vulnerable peasant living in the most powerful empire of its day, 
bringing the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords into human existence, this is a consistent declaration to you and I that we are God bearers, that God seeks to inhabit us. God seeks to literally impregnate us. That God is not limited by your social location, by your struggle, or by your circumstance. But if you can say yes to God, God has already said yes to you. Oh, my goodness, you ought to just say that to myself. If I could just say yes to God, uh, then it shows me how God has already said yes to me. God has already said yes to you by showing up in your life already. He has said yes to you by showing up in your, your illness. God has already said yes to you by showing up in your trial. God has already said yes to you by wiping the tears from your eye. God has already said yes to you by helping you find that therapist. God has already said yes to you by helping you sustain yourself during this pandemic. God has already said yes to you by helping you to wake up every day and say, this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice. Oh, come on, just tell yourself, God has already said yes to me. And because God has already said yes to you, then God's arrival now seeks to neutralize the fear. Understand that the natural emotion of Jesus' arrival in this way was invoking fear in both Joseph and Mary. And it is all right, child of God, for the for the uh, response of us in our humanity to 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 be the opposite of uh, uh, of of virtue at work in the divine. Sometimes there will be a divine and a human collision. That God will introduce things to you that you don't yet have the capacity to fully understand. God will reveal things to you that you do not have the capacity to fully appreciate. Uh, that God will sometimes show you things that you had no idea were even within the scope of your ability. Uh, but it is in those moments where the divine and the humanity collide. Uh, that I want you to know that when God arrives, the humanity through the, the, the as, 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 as the Cappadocians used to say, that God, what is not assumed cannot be redeemed. Uh, that literally God has to show up in our humanity uh, in order to help redeem that, which was at one time thought to be unredeemable. Uh, that it is God showing up in your fears that turn your fear into a redemption thing. Uh, uh, anybody ever, you know, uh, 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 practiced with, with a certain kind of commitment uh, recycling before it became a thing. Uh, you know, I, I was not one of these recycling people because, you know, it just felt like a, a lot of extra work. You know, I'm just kind of like, why do I just throw it all in the trash? Uh, but, but the more I began to become ecologically aware, uh, I began to realize that there were certain things that, although they were not useful to me, they were useful useful or redemptive for another purpose. I want you to know, child of God, that God knows how to take those things in your life that you did not think were useful for you. Lord, I feel like preaching on the fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, God knows how to take those things in your life uh, that you did not think were useful for you, uh, but make them redemptive for somebody else. Uh, do you have a story uh, that you can look back over your life and say, ah, I was glad to get out of that thing, uh, but now I see my story later on has turned into an opportunity of redemption for my son, my daughter, my niece, my, my, my nephew, my, my, my partner, my grandparents, my, my homies in the hood that I got out of that thing, but now that thing is a, now a testimony of God's power to change. Oh, I want you to know, child of God, that there is a moment in your life when God arrives that God 
will make all things worth using. All things will become redeemable. All things will break open the possibility of the new. And that's why I'm so excited about Christmas, uh, because it is a time where you and I can wade through the complexities of our lives and still see that God is with me. Uh, it is a time where you and I can confront the fears of our lives and still see that God is with me. Yeah. And more, most importantly, it is a time where you and I can, can, can rely on the promise uh, that this Jesus, when he shows up, uh, he will save the people from their sins. Uh, it's a time for you and I to be reminded that even when I feel like I'm losing, uh, God is with me, uh, that God comes to save me from my sins, uh, the sins of my personal struggles, uh, the sins of my communal struggles, uh, the sins that are even beyond my capacity to ascertain uh, that God is with me. Uh, and listen, child of God, when God starts to save you, uh, when God starts to redeem you, how many of you know that it begins to spill out into other places? Uh, that salvation is not just a radical personal idea, although it will radically personally transform you. Uh huh. Salvation is not just something that influences you by yourself, although you yourself will be influenced. Uh, but salvation allows the community of the ordinary uh, to bind together to do extraordinary things uh, through the power of an extraordinary God who gives us an extraordinary spirit. Uh, I read across an amazing account uh, of how a group of multiracial 18th century Christians uh, transformed the Christmas celebration uh, into a wake-up call for the whole country to observe. Uh, uh, now understand that in the 1700s, Christmas uh, was a commercial six, uh, commercial practice uh, that was literally a mixture between July 4th and New Year's Eve. Uh, folk would engage in heavy drinking and fighting out in the midst of the cities and the communities. Uh, and as the bitter struggle for human bondage in the United States heated up in the 1800s, uh, there was a small band of multiracial Christians uh, anti-slavery Christian activists known as abolitionists uh, looked up and said, how is it that we can claim uh, on this Christmas day to be followers of Jesus while some of the folk Jesus loves are in chains? Uh, they said, you know what? We're getting ready to make the Prince of Peace uh, a steadfast enemy of oppression. And so in 1834, a militant group of black and white Christians who were a part of the William Lloyd Garrison's Anti-Slavery Society in Massachusetts, they created a Christmas holiday experience to expose the country to the yet uh, to be experienced freedom uh, that seemed to uh, be out of reach for uh, three million men, women, and children held in shackles. Uh, it goes on to say that Boston abolitionist women uh, began to uh, say to themselves, what does it look like for us uh, to organize Christmas fairs uh, that sold donated gifts at fundraising bazaars? Uh, and then we would take the monies from the gifts we sold, uh, and we would then buy gifts uh, and give them out to folks for free. Uh, that sounds like angel tree. I don't know. What, what does it mean for us to use these fairs as a vehicle to drive home a message uh, that people should not be without and in bondage uh, in a season when we celebrate the Prince of Peace? Uh, somebody holler, Christmas saved the country. 
Uh huh. And and then it goes on to say that there were some Sadidi folks. Uh, there were some Northerners who claimed that the degradation of enslaved women and children uh, was too sensitive and immodest a subject to mention in public. Uh, you got folk like that today. Uh, they are so respectable uh, that they don't want to talk about oppression uh, uh, in the public space because it is too unnerving. Uh, 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 but they said we must expose the brutality and the rape that is inherent in the South peculiar institution called slavery. Uh, and so one of the things that they began to adopt, listen to this, uh, in the 1800s was a campaign of evergreen trees. Uh, they said we will start to use evergreen trees uh, and sell them uh, so we can indeed uh, use the profits to help set folk free in bondage down in the South. Uh, uh, I'm talking about how Christmas saved the country. Uh huh. And then in the 1830s, uh, the abolitionists found Christmas fairs, uh, and they used the selling of gifts and the selling of trees to be a primary source of funds. Uh, and so when the author began to describe the Christmas tree, uh, the Christmas tree in the 1800s was the most endeared public holiday symbol that was used to declare that slavery was an unrighteous, wicked institution. Uh, few Americans know that the holiday's most powerful and cherished notion uh, was actually emerging uh, out of a group of abolitionist Christians uh, who said, while we celebrate the Prince of Peace, uh, I will not be privy or an accomplice uh, to the empire bondage of God's people. Why am I saying all that? I'm saying it to say that your salvation as an individual, God's arrival in your life as an individual, will always afford you and I the opportunity to bind up together with folk just like us. And when we get together, how many of you know you can redeem symbols, you can redeem experiences, you can redeem testimonies, testimonies and stories uh, that can persist beyond the time of your own struggle. Uh, child of God, God being with you is hopeful uh, because God's presence is eternal. Uh, and God don't just show up on Christmas. Uh, how many know God is there the day before Christmas? Uh, God is there the day before the day before Christmas. Uh, God is there the day before the day before the day of Christmas. Uh, and God is there after Christmas passes. God is with you. Somebody just shout in your bedroom, in your home right now, God is with me. And because God is with me, oh, I love the song that says, it is more than the world against you. Oh, the message for you this week then, as you get closer to Christmas Day, to the day when we celebrate God's arrival, is that God, while I get closer to the day of celebration, I'm going to live today and every day like it's already a reality. Uh, Minister Wayne preached on it a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to live in the already, uh, uh, even though it has not yet happened. Uh, I'm going to live like it's already done. Uh, I'm going to live like I'm seeing the future of a post-corona reality. Uh, even right now, I may have to cry, uh, but I'm so glad that while I cry, God is with me. Uh, God is the Kleenex. God is the comforter. God is the burden bearer. God is the lifter of my head. God is the song in the middle of the night. God is the bridge over troubled water. God is the wind beneath my wings. God is with me. And I can declare that because God is with me, then hope is here. Hope dwells. Hope remains. Uh, hope persists. Uh, Emmanuel is our hope. Uh, that is, God is uh, with us. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah if you believe it in this building. God is with us. God is with you. God has not forsaken, forgotten, or even abandoned, but God is right here 
with us. And child of God, the sooner you and I can believe that God is with us, the, the more consistently we can believe that God is with us. How many of you know that it then requires a certain kind of confidence? That hope helps me, helps us, even in our most difficult moments to anticipate that, God, you're going you gonna to show up. You're going to make yourself known to me. Make yourself known to us. God, you will be present in a way that I can recognize, not just in the way that I believe. But just like Joseph needed an angel, God will make God's self known. Mary needed a visitation from an angel. Mary needed a, a fellowship with Elizabeth. Mary needed a, 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 a leaping in her womb just to be reminded that God is with us. All the other figures in this passage that we don't get a chance to read today, the shepherds needed a, a messenger. The wise men needed a star. Oh, I want you to know God will give you what you need so you can be reminded that God is with us. God, I pray for the power of your spirit to be made known, to be made manifest. I pray that it will, Lord God, be undeniably the case that in this season of Advent in this holy day of Christmas. God, I pray that we can be a people who can rightly and powerfully declare that Emmanuel is our hope. Meaning God being with us is our hope. God, I pray that this hope that is spread abroad in our hearts through Christ Jesus. God, I pray that it will be as concrete as the despair we feel at times. It will be as real as the depression we feel at times. It will be as real as the grief and the loss and the transitions. Lord God, it will be as real as the sheltering in place we must do when it will be as real as the social distancing we must engage in. God, may your hope be as real as those things. Helping us, Lord God, to see the possibility of that which is yet to come. And God, I pray, Lord, that the complexities of our lives that make us believe we are not worthy, that make us believe we are not included, I pray, God, those complexities will be overran by your presence being with us. I pray, God, that you will show us in a powerful and a mighty way that you are present and you are there. Keep us and touch us and strengthen us and do it, Lord God, in a way that brings glory to your name. I pray for every person who is listening today that has not yet made a decision to follow you. What a great Christmas Advent gift to make Jesus our choice. I pray, Lord, that you will keep showing up. May the incarnation never stop. But may we see ourselves as God-bearers. Just as Mary found herself impregnated by the Holy Spirit with the literal life of the uncreated one, Lord, may we find ourselves filled with the power of your spirit and bearing God all around our families, our children, our neighborhoods, and our communities. And we'll say thank you, Lord, for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. God bless you, people of the way. Amen and amen and amen. 